Hi guys, so we're gonna be discussing a very controversial topic in this video, but it's one that I hope helps you to think through some of what's happening today in the Israel-Palestine conflict or in the Israel-Arab conflict, however you wanna think about it. I have to give you a little bit of context very quickly. So in 2013, I was an international relations student, well, political science student, and one of the things was international relations. And there was a class called Negotiating Middle East Peace because obviously that's what you can do when you are a master's student in international relations, solve all the world's problems and negotiate Middle East peace. As part of this program, we went to Israel, myself and my classmates, which was nice, and had some time at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem to do some research into an issue. And the issue that I'm gonna be presenting to you here, as I say, controversial, but I think it's helpful to think about, is the underlying, as it were, political theology, or stated otherwise, the set of conflicts, basic conflict conflicts, over the very idea that there are occupied territories in Israel. So you know, if you read the news, if you follow it, if you're involved and engaged in any capacity, whether as an activist or as an observer, that there are quote unquote occupied territories, Gaza and the West Bank, and that the grievances over these territories are at the root of the conflict. But as you're gonna see in the paper that I present to you here and walk through with you, there are grounds on which to doubt, really doubt, that it's appropriate to talk about those territories as occupied. That there's a different way that you can look at the whole conflict, different way that you could look at the status of those territories. And the point of zooming out from something that we take for granted, namely the territories are occupied, to something much broader, namely they're occupied only if you interpret them from this perspective, but if you interpret them from this other perspective, then they have a different status. The point of that, as you'll see, is not to whitewash any crimes on one side or another. It's not to say we value or don't value the lives of this side or the other side. It's to try to engage intellectually with the basic concepts of the conflict. So in other words, what I'm presenting here and what I'm proposing is that it's helpful, maybe not politically helpful, I'll leave that for you to decide, but somehow humanly helpful for us to try to think through the problem. And if you've followed this channel or you understand that the point of this channel is to show you how philosophy can be helpful in making sense of the world, philosophy, to the extent to which it deals with basic concepts, has to push us a step back, you know, so that we can see more than we do from a narrow set of prior assumptions. Okay, so keep in mind, number one, this was written quite some time ago, 10 years ago. Number two, it's kind of experimental. Number three, it's on this controversial topic about the occupation, as you'll see, and whether that's the right way to interpret it. And at the same time, I think if you stick it through, there's quite a bit that you're gonna get out of it. You're gonna learn to think about the situation in a way that maybe you never did before. You might see something you didn't see before. And whether you are supportive of the arguments that I present or whether you're completely opposed to them, I encourage you to, a comment, hash it out, make a response video if you'd like to, see what you considered strong and weak and all of that. So without further ado, let's jump into the paper, into the arguments and into the presentation. Okay, so let's get into it now. Jewish democratic territorial legal analysis of a flawed model towards a new conception of the conflict. In this paper, I argue that the model according to which Israel can be any two, but not all three, of Jewish, democratic, and territorial is flawed. Okay, so as you're gonna see, I heard this very often, Israel can be Jewish and democratic, but then it has to give up the territories because if it rules over the territories, it's gonna be demographically too much in the direction of the Palestinians, and therefore it's either gonna be democratic, in which case it'll lose its Jewish character, or if it wants to preserve its Jewish character, it'll have to be undemocratic. It won't be able to give rights to the Palestinians, okay? So that model, the model according to which Israel can be any two but not all three of Jewish, democratic, and territorial is flawed. I approach the question through the lens of law, national law, international law, and religious law, which in the Jewish case is called halakha. So one of the things, by the way, I don't do in this paper, but it would be interesting for somebody to, to do or to supplement this argument with is, well, what is the status of the territories from the point of view of Islamic law? But here I only focus on Jewish religious law. I then abstract to the theological philosophical presuppositions of law. I conclude that analyses of the Israel slash Palestine or Israel slash Arab conflict tend to be legally and philosophically biased and call for broader philosophical horizon to be sought. 
as I said in the introductory video. The range of solutions available in the conflict between Israel and the Palestinian Arabs, henceforth Palestinians, has sometimes been formulated as follows. And let me just pause here. I mentioned, I wrote this as a master's student. I wrote it 10 years ago. So sometimes there's going to be academic -y jargon or student style writing. Okay, but it's worth sitting through that to get to the punchlines, I think. So the range of solutions has sometimes been formulated as follows. Israel can be any two, but not all three of Jewish, democratic, and territorial, where territorial means encompassing the territories lying east of the armistice lines of 1948, the so-called Green Line. That's what territorial means, the quote-unquote occupied territories. On this account, Israel can hold on to the territories, but if it does so as a democracy, it will, for demographic reasons, cease to be Jewish in its state character. The assumption is that the Arab population will vote democratically to change the Jewish character of the state. Alternatively, Israel can hold on to the territories and maintain its Jewish character, but only by ceasing to extend rights to the Arab inhabitants of the state, that is by ceasing to act democratically. Finally, the argument proceeds, Israel can be both Jewish and democratic, in which case it must not acquire sovereignty over the territories. And you see there are a lot of different authors who made that sort of analysis. In this paper, I challenged that model of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict through a legal approach. First, I turned to the territorial question. The territories are customarily referred to as occupied territories in accordance with the claim that they're occupied as a matter of legal fact under the Geneva Conventions. This claim is disputable. I present the argument that the territories are not occupied as a matter of legal fact, neither under international law nor under Israeli law. Okay, so I think that's going to be a very controversial and interesting claim for people to, uh, to hear. If this is accepted, maximally, that is if the territories are not occupied and not even disputed, but completely under Israeli sovereignty, it follows from the three-part model that Israel must be either democratic or Jewish, but not both. You see? So if you say the territories aren't occupied, they're actually Israeli territories. Then if you think Israel could be in only two of the three, it must be either democratic or Jewish. So that leads to the second part of the analysis. And that's what I'm going to discuss here. In 1992, a law was passed in Israel enshrining the values of the state of Israel as, quote, a Jewish and democratic state, unquote. That's the basic law on human dignity and liberty in Israel. So you may know Israel doesn't have a constitution. It has a set of quasi-constitutional so-called basic laws, and that is one of them. In section two, I examine two interpretations of this law, former Supreme Court of Israel Chief Justice Barak's and former Deputy President of Supreme Court of Israel Cohn's. Okay, so two analyses of that basic law that Israel is a Jewish and democratic state. The result of the analysis, why are we looking into it, what do we learn from it, is that Jewish and democratic is in fact interpreted as Jewish or democratic because of an ultimate incompatibility between Jewish and democratic. So as I'm going to say in that section, and as I'll uh, tell you now in a prefiguration of it, the Supreme Court jurisprudence in Israel, the debates over the meaning of Jewish and democratic, tends to be a radical distinction between the two and sort of an incompatibility between them. Accordingly, if Jewish and democratic is not a viable or consistent combination, the three-part model, which allows for a Jewish, democratic, and non-territorial solution, has to be rejected or modified. In other words, it's not going to be possible for Israel to be Jewish and democratic if those two things are somehow fundamentally incompatible. Instead of the three-part model, I suggest that the real alternatives are a Jewish and territorial state, which can draw on democratic principles and practices at its discretion, or a democratic and non-Jewish state, which may or may not be territorial. As is evident, the first option is available in the three-part model, so the three-part model allows for it to be Jewish, territorial, and non-democratic. But the idea of a democratic, non-Jewish, non-territorial option is missing. So don't worry, this is again, just me setting out the possible options, but we're going to get into the meat of the argument in a second. In part three, I present another argument against that model, which builds on the previous section. Specifically, I argue that the authentically Jewish choice cannot be made without considering the status of the territories under the halakha, under the Jewish law. That is the perspective of religious Zionism, a perspective that can't be discounted a priori, renders the separation of Jewish from territories problematic. The arguments of part one to three suggest that the three-part model begs important questions. In other words, it assumes things at the outset that should be in dispute. Among these is the question of the validity of the halakhic notions 
Jewish, democratic, and territorial. So a lot of people who write on Israel, Israel in relationship to international law, they don't interpret the conflict in terms of religious Jewish law. Now, that makes sense because that seems like that's narrow, it's partial. You might even think it's parochial, it's backwards, it's reactionary, whatever. It's pre-modern, it's archaic. But as we think about it, it's not obvious why at the outset we shouldn't at least consider the claims of the religious Zionists because they're one of the voices of the dispute. They're part of the dispute. Just like I think when people examine all of the Palestinian factions, it would be weird not to think about the status of the state of Israel and its territories from the point of view of the Palestinian religious fundamentalists, not just their secularists, not just their Marxists, not just uh, you know their revolutionary factions. If you're thinking about the conflict, it means you have to take into account all the relevant players at all the relevant levels of analysis. So finally, when I set all of this out, again, in an academic paper, you have to prefigure these things. Uh, I'm going to step back to the philosophical dimension and then say something about the political implications, okay? As I wrote in the section on method and motivation, I approached my critical analysis of the threefold model on the basis of a strong intuition. The intuition is that analyses of the Arab-Israeli conflict in general and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in general, regularly employ legal concepts as political weapons without due regard for matters of legal fact. And, you know, frankly, I think that you can find that on both sides of the dispute. Furthermore, previous research has taught me that the war of political ideas in which legal concepts are used as weapons depends to a great extent, perhaps even entirely, on philosophical and theological disputes. So before I just read the next part of the paper, I'm going to tell you. So it's like, politically, you have the invocation of legal concepts as a weapon of political war. But behind the political concepts, excuse me, behind the legal concepts, in my experience, there's always a dispute, a philosophical and theological dispute. So we're going to kind of climb that ladder from the political dispute to the legal dispute to the dispute at the realm of a theology and philosophy. So at once the question was before me, does the use of these legal concepts in the Israeli-Arab and Israeli-Palestinian conflicts constitute a political action in defense of a philosophic or theological position? If so, could I uncover, and can we uncover here together, the hidden polemics and remove some of the aura of objectivity that accompanies the use of legal concepts by situating them in their polemical concept, uh, context? You all know the apparent objective neutrality of the invocation of international law. I don't need to tell you that. If you've observed politics for any period of time, surely you know that, and all the more so if you've ever studied uh, people like Carl Schmitt. What I asked myself is the source of the claim that the territories are illegally occupied. What's the source of that claim? Or that Israel must be Jewish and democratic as a default. And God forbid if it should prefer to be Jewish rather than democratic. If the source of the occupation claim is international law, do the principles of international law and those of Israeli law conflict? What about Israeli law and halakhic law, a relevant element in the consideration of the meaning of Jewish in a legal perspective, since after all, there is such a thing as Jewish law? How are such conflicts between international, national, and Jewish law resolved by Israeli jurists? I had been suspicious of international law at the outset for reasons I discuss in section four, but what about Israeli law? How does it conceive of the territories? What is the role of traditional Jewish law in contemporary Israeli jurisprudence? And how does this affect the terms in which the Arab-Israeli conflict is discussed within Israel and outside of it? What's the halakhic status of the territories? Okay, what's the status in Jewish law of the territories? What about the status in Jewish law of democracy? What, moreover, is the legal philosophy of the justices of the Supreme Court of Israel? Is it consistent or not with the legal philosophy of international law, with the presuppositions, presuppositions of halakha? These are all the questions that I had in my mind when I was in Israel at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem for a short period of time in this course negotiating Middle East peace. How do you reconcile, once you're even aware of the multiplicity of legal frameworks, at the very least, international and national. Then you add Jewish religious law. And as I say, we're leaving Islamic religious law out of the picture just because it didn't occur to me when I was doing this study to also include that. But now you have these competing legal approaches and you want to look from the perspective of each of them and see how would you adjudicate the differences? And what's, you know, it, these complicated, fascinating uh, questions. 
controversial, I think, only because they're unusual and they may lead to conclusions that aren't the ones that we normally are uh, told to consider. So it's not at all obvious that such questions, I admit, and the approach I have taken to them will contribute positively to the process of peaceful negotiations between the Israelis and their Arab neighbors. Okay, I'm not promising that this is going to lead to peace. Yet in making my arguments, I've assumed that clarity about the relevant and fundamental options is more important than their obfuscation, even if that obfuscation should result in more peaceful relations or the illusory promise of them than clarity does. I hope my analysis will prove helpful by revealing the polemical context of the use of legal notions. So it's like, look, maybe one way to get a peaceful outcome is just to forget about the basic disputes, forget about the basic concepts, ignore all the substantive issues, and somehow settle on a compromise that ignored the deep, uh, fr the deep uh, fissures, okay? And all of that, which is okay, that's one option. But another option is to try to be clear about what those deep differences are. It doesn't mean that you have to give up peace as your main goal, but it also doesn't mean that peace is going to be a natural outcome of this conceptual analysis, okay? It just means that we put clarity as a high uh, priority in this particular question. So now you could even see everything that I just said as a sort of preliminary. And uh, we're going to turn directly to the question of the territories. Now we enter into the argument about the status of the territories. The territories east of the armistice lines of 1948 and west of the Jordan River are widely referred to as occupied territories, occupied Palestinian territories, or the occupied West Bank. Religious Zionists tend to refer to the territories as Judea and Samaria, or as disputed or liberated territories. Yet the term occupied territories is by far the one most widely used. I'm sure you have heard that many, many more times than you've ever heard it referred to as disputed or liberated. Why? This is primarily due to two reasons. First, it is the position of the United States that occupation describes a legal fact. Hence, the notion of occupation has, did I say United States? Excuse me, of the United Nations. Hence, the notion of occupation has the sanction of the UN behind it, and together with that sanction, the legit legitimacy, real or perceived, of international law. Okay? According to the UN, the territories are occupied, and that gives you a pretty serious legal gravitas uh, if you think that the UN's word is worth something. Second, those sympathetic to the Palestinian side of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict effectively capitalize on the propaganda or public relations value of the notion of an illegal occupation. And you can see a paper here that I'm re referring to, the open forum on strategizing Palestine. In other words, it's explicitly a valuable propaganda and political relations notion by design. I think you can see that in the current dispute as well, in the current war as well. In this section, I argue that it is not a legal fact, but a fiction or a myth that the territories are occupied territories by law from the perspective both of Israeli law and of international law. Okay, so the argument that I'm going to make in this section is that there's no occupation either under international law or under Israeli law. Obviously, an outlier, I think, as far as these kinds of claims go, but okay, that's what I'm going to argue. So Israeli law and the origins of the myth of occupation. A piece of writing that influenced my thought here, as you see, is called The Origin of the Occupation Myth by Howard Grief, written in 2005. In that work, Grief traces the legal circumstances under which the territories east of the armistice lines of 1948, okay, the so-called West Bank, came to be called and conceived of as the occupied territories. Because he finds no legal basis in Israel's national law, for the application of international laws of war to the territories, he calls the notion of illegal occupation a myth. In other words, it's not just enough that they're, let's say, occupied under international law. There's also the nation's law concerning the application of international law. On Mr. Grief's account, okay, or on Grief's account, um, the person most responsible for this myth is Mayor Shamgar, former military advocate general, attorney general of Israel, and president of the Supreme Court of Israel. The specific charge that Grief levels against former Justice Shamgar is that the latter, in his role as military advocate general, was at the epicenter of the decision made by Prime Minister Levi Eshkol's national unity government during the Six-Day War, 1948-1949. to 
to apply not Israeli law, but the laws of war to all the liberated Jewish territories, in particular the provisions of the Hague Regulations, as well as the Fourth Geneva Convention of 1948. So this is getting into the weeds, but Grief said, there is such and such a person, Shamgar. He was a military advocate general, and he was at the center of a decision made by then Prime Minister Levi Eshkol's National Unity Government to apply not Israeli law, but the laws of war to the what's usually called the occupied territories. So let's see why that matters. It's unclear why Shamgar chose to apply international rather than national law to the territories. Yet despite the difficulty of explaining his motivations, it is nevertheless possible to ask what the status of the territories ought under international, excuse me, under national law to have been. So what would have been the status of the territories if national law, not international law, had been applied to them? Uh, Grief discusses two crucial Israeli laws which were in effect prior to the enactment a few weeks after fighting had ended uh, of section 11b of the law and administration ordinance. Again, this is in the weeds, but if it's a legal claim, then you have to look at the laws. If it's a moral or propagandistic claim, then that's different. But, you know, part of the argument of this paper is that those two things are related. The legal claim becomes a basis for a propagandistic claim. The two laws are the Area of Jurisdiction and Powers Ordinance and the Law of Return. The former, as he writes, was used in 1948 by Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion and Justice Minister Pinchas Rosen in applying the corpus of law of the State of Israel to territories of the land of Israel beyond the UN partition lines. So UN had a partition plan for Palestine. Part of that was a Jewish state. Then there was a war in 1948. The Jewish territory went beyond the partition lines. And at that time, there was the application of this area of jurisdiction and powers ordinance, which covered the territories that went beyond what the UN had given. Okay, so an application of Israeli law, separate from the application of international law in the case of those uh, territories in 1948. Uh, and this other one, the Law of Return, entitled Jews to settle in all parts of the land of Israel under Israel's expanded jurisdiction. Some of you may know about that law. The first law had two proclamations as part of it, the Israel Defense Forces Government in the land of Israel and the Israel Defense Forces Government in Jerusalem. Okay, two proclamations as part of this law. Uh, Grief calls them the Israel Proclamation and the Jerusalem Proclamation, and I follow his usage. The relevance of these two laws and two proclamations consists in their rendering illegal. The proclamation made by Brigadier General Herzog in 1967, that Jordanian law rather than Israeli law would be applied in the West Bank. Now, I don't know how much you know about the history of these territories in terms of when they were under Jordanian law, you know, between 1948 and 1967. So um, there's a proclamation in 1967 that Jordanian law would be applied in the West Bank. Proclamation regarding regulation uh, and of administration and law. This proclamation was issued 12 days before Section 11B, which it presupposes had been enacted. Uh, before the enactment of 11B, the Ordinance Land of Israel Proclamation, Jerusalem Proclamation were in effect. So let me just explain that here too briefly. Uh, there is a proclamation regarding the regulation of administration and law that said that Jordanian law would be applied in the West Bank. But that was issued before the section that it presupposes had been enacted. So there's like a confusing order of the enactment of these laws. And according to the argument advanced by Grief in his piece on the myth of the, uh, the origins of the occupation myth, these documents, the ordinance, the Land of Israel Proclamation, the Jerusalem Proclamation, and the Law of Return, being the laws in effect at the time, they should have been applied in the captured territories. The application of Israeli law was required even though the regions were thenceforth governed by a military government exactly as happened in 1948. Let me again briefly say, I know this is difficult. I'd be surprised if anybody's still watching this, but I want to have it uh, on the record for those of you who are interested. The idea is that Israel ought to have applied to the territories of the West Bank the same laws that it applied to the territories that it won in the 1948 war because the same laws were in effect, basically, okay? Basically. Uh, 
the application of Israeli law in this instance would have resulted in the incorporation of captured territories into the state of Israel, just as their application to territories outside of the UN partition plan resulted in the incorporation of those territories into the state of Israel. You see, just as Israel in 1948 ended up being bigger than the UN partition plan because you had the war, Israeli victory in the war, and then the application of Israeli law to those territories, the exact same thing should have happened in 1967, according to this argument. But for the illegal, as it were, or arbitrary decision of the people that grief has mentioned. Uh, the laws in effect, though, were not applied. Instead, Jordanian law was declared to remain in effect in the territories, resulting in the application of international laws of war, as Mr. Shamgar, or as Shamgar had wanted. Under those laws, as I discuss in the next section, Israel was considered an occupying power. Okay, so Israel was considered an occupying power under the international laws of war, which became, which were put into effect because Jordanian law was declared to remain in effect in the territories, whereas it shouldn't have. Israeli law should have been applied. As a result, then, of the plan devised by Shamgar, quote, every person in the world today outside Israel, and indeed a very substantial number of Israel's own population called Judea, Samaria, and until very recently Gaza, occupied territories when they are in truth integral parts of the land of Israel under Israeli law. Uh, just about this part here, the until very recently, if I'm not mistaken, I think he's referring to the withdrawal of Israeli forces from Gaza in 2005. So until recently, they had also referred to Gaza as occupied, then withdrew, Israel withdrew its forces. So therefore the until very recently, okay? So I don't intend to examine, as I write in this paper, Grief's argument in any greater detail than this. The purpose of my brief analysis of his argument is to show the plausibility of the claim that according to the application of Israeli law, the territories are not occupied as a matter of legal fact, since the application of international law to those territories after the 1967 war was done in contravention of Israeli law, according to which they ought to have been incorporated into the state of Israel. A reasonable doubt as to the proposition that the territories are occupied under Israeli law is all that I aim here to provoke. So the next section goes to consider international law and the conditions of occupation, but first I want to say a few things. Obviously, that section did not prove decisively, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt that according to Israeli law, the territories are or are not occupied. It just was, when I read that book or argument by grief, um, a compelling statement of the fact that the decision to apply Jordanian law was Ill illegitimate, was not legal, and that you could reconstruct the history where the correct application would have been done in 67, just as it was done in 48, and the territories would have the same status as the rest of Israel does, okay? So I thought that was thought-provoking enough. It was the first time I had encountered that sort of argument, and it made me think. Now, of course, you know that executive decision can often run ahead of the law, and it can also create facts on the ground that the law has to try to catch up to, and that the law can do little more than a rubber stamp after the fact. So when Shamgar and um, the decision was made to apply Jordanian law, not to apply the Israeli law on the books, somehow it's like tough luck. That's what they decided. And the decision of the sovereign in some sense becomes the law, even if it was against the law at the time that it was made. I mean, that's a, that's a fact that has to be kept in mind as well. Nevertheless, uh, I thought that that was an important argument to go over. But now we turn somehow to a different and even more um, salient aspect of the question of occupation, which is this, is it legally correct under international law to refer to the territories of the West Bank region as occupied territories or even occupied Palestinian territories? Avinoam Sharon argues that it is not. In this section, I present his arguments to continue supporting the strong claim that the territories are occupied neither under national law nor under international law, and the weaker claim that there are reasons to dispute okay, the idea that they are legally speaking occupied territories. So again, the purpose of all of this was to raise a doubt about a notion that we usually treat as a settled fact. First, the word occupation is used to describe two different instances. When an armed force holds territory beyond the borders of its own nation, and when a situation falls within the limited scope of the term occupation as defined in international law. It's the second case that I want to discuss in more detail. So specifically, the legal interpretation, not just the armed force holding territory beyond the borders of its, of its own nation, but the limited scope of the term occupation as defined in international law. In contrast to the legal notion of occupation, 
which became dominant in the 19th century. Sharon relates the historical notion of occupation as one in which enemy territory occupied by a belligerent was in every point considered his state property so that he could do what he liked with it and its inhabitants. This concept, though, underwent fundamental changes in the 19th century when, starting with the Hague Regulations of 1899, an attempt was made to put legal limitations on military occupiers. The relevant articles of the Hague Regulations of 1899, which are the same as those in the Hague Regulations of 1907, set out three conditions without which an area cannot be determined, uh, cannot be deemed as occupied in the legal sense. So it's like, you have the claim that territories are occupied under international law. It's okay, I think, uncontroversial, I would assume, to ask, well, what are the legal criterion of occupation? The legal criteria, excuse me, of occupation. So we're just looking into that question here on the basis, admittedly, of one person's presentation, but one that I found helpful uh, in which I'm therefore presenting in this paper. So what are these three conditions? In Sharon's words, they are that the area is under the actual control of the hostile army. So if it's not under the control of the army, it's not occupied. The area was previously the sovereign territory of another state. And the occupier holds the area with the purpose of returning it to the prior sovereign. In accordance with those articles of the Hague Convention that aim at the maintenance of the status quo ante. Now, the Hague regulations were on shaky ground after World War I. And a case can be made that they lost their legal authority altogether after World War II. As a result, the Fourth Geneva Convention was drafted. Yet, as Schroen notes, the definition of occupation was not changed between Hague and Geneva. The emphasis from responsibility to states to responsibility to populations might have changed. But the notion that an occupation requires by law that the occupied territory was previously the sovereign territory of another state was left unaltered. And as you see, this condition poses a problem for the status of the West Bank region. Why? After the War of Independence, Jordan's assertion of sovereignty over that region failed to be recognized internationally. That is, it was not clear that the West Bank region was Jordan's sovereign territory before 1967. The dispute over whether it was or was not is the crucial element of the argument against the legal application of the Geneva Convention in that region. Sharon argues that Israel hesitated to apply the Geneva Conventions de Jure since this would, amount, this would amount to a renunciation of sovereign rights by Israel to the areas. What is more, the Euro application could be construed as acceptance of the 1949 ceasefire lines as international borders. Thus, Israel never recognized the territories as legally occupied because they disputed that the legal conditions of an occupation had been met. Okay, To restate, according to the relevant international conventions, Territory can be considered occupied by law when previously it belonged to, let's read that again, when previously it was the sovereign territory of another state. So the question follows, it has to follow from the point of view of a legal analysis. Were the West Bank territories, territories of a sovereign state? Well, they were under the control of Jordan, but they were not recognized as under Jordanian sovereignty. And therefore, it's not obvious that you can refer to them as occupied under international law since one of the criteria doesn't apply. That's the argument. Okay? Again, the exercise here is to think about something that we always take for granted. You may disagree. I'm not an international lawyer. I told you I was a master's student when I wrote this, but this was my best attempt at the time to try to puzzle through the legal dispute. Okay? So... Uh, Israel never recognized the territories as legally occupied because they disputed the legal conditions of an occupation had been met. When the International Committee of the Red Cross, the official guardian of the Fourth Geneva Convention, as they were called in this piece that I refer to, refers to Israel as an occupier under the Geneva Conventions, it, quote, does not rely upon a rejection of Israel's legal interpretation of the definition of occupation in customary law, but rather advances the argument that quote-unquote humanitarian considerations outweigh the legal question, which is also incredible if you think about it. I will not repeat Sharon's decisive arguments against this position, for the issue at stake in this section is one that the ICRC did not dispute, whether de jure Israel is an occupying power in the West Bank. So in other words, Sharon says here that the International Committee of the Red Cross accepts the argument, as it were, that uh, Israel can reject the legal interpretation of the definition of occupation 
But instead, it puts a different emphasis, namely a humanitarian emphasis, and on that basis continues to call the territories occupied. If the notion of sovereignty is a crucial component of the definition of occupation in international law, and there was no recognized sovereign in the West Bank region prior to 1967, there is no legal occupation there after 1967, all humanitarian and political protestations notwithstanding. Sharon considers other arguments against the notion of occupation stemming from Israel's peace agreements with Jordan in 1948 and the Palestinian Authority during the Oslo process, especially the interim agreement of 1995. The heart of these arguments is that even if Israel had been an occupying power, the agreement with Jordan, which set the legal borders between Israel and Jordan, and the agreement with the Palestinian Authority, which ceded authority over Area A areas, would have modified that status. So if you don't know, you know, you can't just treat the West Bank as there are areas that were uh, developed, Area A, B, and C, out of this agreement with the Palestinian Authority. So again, without getting too much into the weeds, all of that is an argument in support of the contestability of the notion of occupation as applied legally rather than polemically or politically to the West Bank region. So now a summary. There's good reason to doubt the claim that the West Bank region is occupied territory, both in terms of national, meaning Israeli, and international law. It's possible to formulate this claim minimally or maximally. Minimally, the territories are not occupied, but disputed. And perhaps, as I put parenthetically, Area A is indispu indisputably Palestinian because of the agreement with the PA. Maximally, the whole West Bank region is Israel's. In order to continue my argument, I assume the maximalist interpretation. So it's not the only one, but it's the one that I assume for the sake of the argument in this paper. Since on the maximalist interpretation, Israel is completely quote-unquote territorial, that is sovereign over the territories east of the armistice lines of 1948 and west of the Jordan River, the so-called West Bank, or Judea and Samaria, depending on how you look at it, it must be one or the other of Jewish and democratic, but not both. However, according to the basic laws of 1992, Israel is both a Jewish and democratic state. So how should this contradiction be understood? You get it? We're going to prove for the purposes of the argument that Israel is territorial. On the original tripartite model, it can now be only either Jewish or democratic. But according to Israel's basic law, Israel is Jewish and democratic. So if we put all of that together, then we have Israel is Jewish, democratic, and territorial, but that's not supposed to be the case. Therefore, we have a puzzle. We have something to think about. We have an aporia. We have to keep going. The purpose of the next section is to argue against two legal interpretations of the basic laws. I argue that these legal interpretations fail to reconcile Jewish and democratic. In this sense, I will be supporting the argument that Jewish cannot be, excuse me, that Israel cannot be Jewish, territorial, and democratic. However, I do not thereby support the three-part model because I deny in the terms of the analysis of this paper, that Israel can be Jewish, democratic, and non-territorial. Since, as I said, I've just assumed the maximalist interpretation of the territorial question. Hence, I'm further developing the argument that legal analysis helps to undermine the coherence of the three-part model. Okay, so let's turn our attention now to the question of Israel's status as a Jewish and democratic state. Not every Supreme Court justice past and present will agree with the interpretations of Barack and Cohn, of which I will be critical below. Notwithstanding, given their influence in Israeli legal scholarship, so unless you're an expert here, you probably don't know, but uh, I'm going to tell you, and if you are an expert, you do know, that these two figures have some preeminent status. So given their influence in Israeli legal scholarship, a critique of certain aspects of their approach will prove instructive. Specifically, it will show that attempts to reconcile Jewish and democratic principles has not succeeded thus calling into question the assumption of the three-part model that they can be combined consistently. You know, that you can think about a Jewish and democratic Israel without there being a fundamental contradiction there. Barak has written as follows concerning the reconciliation of Jewish and democratic values, quote, We are a democracy, and our values are the values of every democracy. But we are also a Jewish state, and therefore our values are the values of a Jewish state. All of Israeli society will need to face this duality. Philosophers and researchers, rabbis and professions, maybe that was professionals originally in a typo, in which case, excuse me, yeshiva students and university students, all the strata of Israeli society will need to ask themselves, what are the values of the state of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state? We also expect the contribution of philosophers and researchers from around the world, uh, Barak wrote, and 
As I say, I shall take his invitation for researchers around the world to contribute to an analysis of the duality between the Jewish and democratic aspects of the state of Israel as my permission to engage critically Barak's own attempts at reconciling those aspects. Okay, so as it were, we have the go ahead. The need to interpret the phrase, the values of the state of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state arises from the use of that phrase in two basic laws, basic law, um, human dignity and liberty and basic law, freedom of occupation, which at least on Barak's account constitute part of the formal constitution of the state of Israel. I repeat, Israel does not have a constitution officially. Okay, it's a big debate and dispute and issue in Israeli society, the need for a constitution, the question of a constitution. Okay, you know that before the war with Hamas, which is going on at the moment, the big issue in Israel that you may have read about was the um, judicial reform. Okay, also related to this question. The fundamental weakness of Barak's interpretation of this phrase, again, the values of the state of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state, is summarized well by this figure, Mao's, quote, Barak emphasizes that his approach to resolving the contradiction between the values of Judaism and democracy is neutral and objective, but in fact, his model favors democratic values. In his essay, Israel as a Jewish and Democratic State, included in the volume called Israel as a Jewish and Democratic State, Barak distinguishes as part of the values of Judaism what he calls the Zionist aspect and the aspect of heritage or tradition. The values of the heritage aspect are, in his presentation, contained in halakha, in the Jewish, traditional Jewish law. The Zionist aspect contains apparently political Zionist, cultural Zionist, and religious Zionist elements. Okay, so Barak is writing about this question. He separates the Zionist from the halakhic, and on the Zionist side, you have political, cultural, and apparently also religious. Barak says of the democratic values of the state of Israel, that they are the same values that at any given time reflect the basic perceptions of modern democracy. In our time, democracy is perceived as a popular representative government of the majority with rule of law, separation of governmental powers, and a concern with the protection of human rights. That is, for Barack, democracy is liberal democracy. There may be tensions and contradictions between the values of Israel as a Jewish state and the values of Israel as a democratic state, Barack recognizes. Yet, we must search for an integration between the different values of the state of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state in an attempt to create a homogenous and inclusive perception. Okay, so how is this done? Through mutual concessions, he writes, it's possible to find the proper balance. All right, so we have this idea, concessions. And here, Barak offers an example of a concession that Jewish values have to make to democratic values. Quoting, if within the world of halakha, there is a stream of particularism and a stream of universalism, it would be appropriate for the interpreter to adopt the stream of universalism since this stream is more easily integrated with the values of Israel as a democratic state. So how are you going to affect this reconciliation while well, you're doing religious law, halakha, and you have something that can be interpreted as it were democratically or not, universalistically or particularistically? And Barak says you should compromise by interpreting it democratically. The notion of mutual concessions, however, requires that the democratic tradition concede something to the Jewish tradition, right? It can't go just one way. The example that Barak provides of such a concession is as follows. If he writes from the perspective of democracy, there are various ways of viewing interpersonal relationships. It's appropriate to choose that approach that is similar to the values of Israel as a Jewish state. The question that must be raised, in my opinion, at the time and now, is this, is it a concession of the principles or of the essentials of democracy to select among one among various ways sanctioned by democracy, um, to select one among various ways sanctioned by democracy of doing something? Okay, let me continue reading it here and we'll make sure we understand it. And is it a concession of the principles or essentials of Judaism to select one among two or more streams within Judaism? Is the attempt to make mutual concessions doomed to result in the concession of principles only on one side of the equation and the concession of something less important than principles on the other? Let me restate that so it's nice and clear. According to Barak, the Jewish side has to make concessions to the democratic side. The democratic side has to make concessions to the Jewish side. And the question that I asked is, what is each side conceding? Is it conceding tit for tat, principle for principle? 
Or am I conceding $10 and you're conceding five? I'm conceding something extremely valuable, first principles, and you're conceding something comparatively less valuable, subordinate principles, secondary principles, derivations, something trivial. You know, In that case, that would not be equal. If I had to substitute my principle for something of less value, whereas you got to keep your principle, then that's not a mutual concession that you could call 50-50. That's the superiority of your position to my position. And in fact, on my view, it's clear that for Barack, mutual concessions means that democracy never concedes its principles or essentials while Judaism does. For instance, Barack asks the question whether the values of Israel as a Jewish state detract from the principle of equality. This is an important question because there is no democracy without equality, as he writes. According to Barak, all rights upon which democracy is based are built on equality. It follows that equality is an essential principle of democracy for Barak. Barak responds to his question with a negative. The values of Israel as a Jewish state do not detract from the principle of equality. They cannot do so because as values of the state of Israel as a Jewish state, are also values of a democratic state, they support the principle of equality. In other words, since by definition, Israel is Jewish and democratic, it can't concede equality because equality is a principle of democracy. You get it? What is essential to democracy? Equality. So can there be a conflict between Israel's Jewish values and its democratic values on the question of equality? No, because that would mean sacrificing the democratic side of the equation. By this logic, since by definition Israel is not only democratic but Jewish, it cannot concede the principle or principles of the Zionist aspect and halakhic aspects of Israel as a Jewish state, right? Can't trade one thing of value for something of less value. If it's essential to democracy, then what's essential to the Jewish side has to be kept as well. Even without demonstrating that there's a conflict at the level of principles between democracy and the halakha, religious law, it follows that there's a conf it follows that if there's a conflict at the level of principles, it will not be possible to make a decision that keeps both principles or both sets of principles, fundamentals, or essentials intact. A decision will be made in favor of one or the other. That's the key point. A decision will be made in favor of one or the other. And so all the talk of mutual concessions and the load-bearing weight of the and, Jewish and democratic, it falls apart. So in fact, this consequence becomes explicit in Kohn. Kohn writes that the legislator actively chooses or selects from the halakha certain specific norms and rejects others. The legislator must do so for, quote, not all that is Jewish to the extent it is halakhic is capable of being democratic. For instance, any curtailment of freedom by religion or religious halakha might well transform the state from a Jewish and democratic state into a halakhic one, as he worries. One that's ruled, like let's call it, call it a theocracy if you prefer. Of the principles of the Jewish heritage, the legislator selected freedom, justice, equity, and peace, as can be seen in the Foundations of Law Act, which reads as follows. Where the court, faced with a legal question requiring decision, finds no answer to it in statute law or case law or by analogy, it shall decide it in the light of the principles of freedom, justice, equity, and peace of Israel's heritage. Okay, the source for that is the Foundations of Law Act 1980. This selection implies to repeat, rejection, the rejection of whatever is inconsistent with democratic principles. Cohen is not ashamed that it implies the rejection of such principles of the Jewish heritage as slavery, discrimination, fanaticism, or hatred. Seems fair, right? You're like, the Jewish tradition includes a lot of things in it, and we're going to select, you know, justice, peace, equity, and we're not going to select, you know, slavery uh, and these other elements because we're going to make our reading of the Jewish tradition compatible with democratic principles. That seems fine. But what's striking is that he's also not ashamed of the most prominent of the implied rejections, quote, the cardinal principle of belief in the God of Israel. He refers to this principle and to other undemocratic principles as chaff that must be separated from the wheat of democracy. In the conflict between the Jewish and democratic character of the state of Israel then, as it is reflected in the legal problem of the interpretation of the basic laws and other related laws, the heart of Judaism, its cardinal principle, to say nothing of its other principles, does not survive the separation of the wheat from the chaff. 
okay, you got to see how major that is, right? We're going to make a selection and yeah, we're just going to exclude belief in God. Suddenly that's not such a fair trade. To return to Barak's argument that the principle of democracy, equality, cannot be conceded because Israel is a democratic state, it's now possible to say that such an argument betrays the fact, evident in Cohn, that mutual concessions really refers to the concession to ultimate democratic principles of ultimate Jewish ones. If the ultimate principle of democracy cannot be conceded without conceding the democratic character of the state, as Barak asserts, according to his own logic, concession of the ultimate Jewish principle, okay, existence of God, amounts to a concession of the Jewish character of the state, for sure, in my view. In a nutshell, this is the problem of assuming that Jewish principles and democratic principles can be reconciled without the sacrifice of one through a decision in favor of the other. Okay, so that was pretty amazing. Again, I didn't know that going into my research. I tried to look at the legal scholarship among Supreme Court justices in Israel concerning the basic laws on Israel's identity. And when you read them and you think them through, you come to that conclusion, as far as I can tell, that sacrifice of the Jewish side is made for the benefit of the democratic side. Part three. Oh, by the way, and that tells us something about the meaning of Jewish and democratic, namely that really uh, a strong emphasis has been placed on the, on the democratic to such an extent that the key Jewish principle has been negated in one interpretation. So now we have part three, Jewish and territorial, but we're interpreting Jewish under halakha or under Jewish religious law. In the previous section, I indicated that the legal conflict between Jewish and democratic principles has been resolved in some quarters at the cost of the cardinal principle of the Jewish tradition. Suppose, however, that this conflict had been decided differently. If the presumption is in favor of the halakha rather than democracy, orthodoxy rather than Spinozism, can the split between Jewish and territorial be maintained? In 1975, Tradition, an Orthodox journal, featured an article called Survey of the Recent Halakhic Periodical Literature, The Sanctity of the Liberated Territories. By the way, what I'm about to say, don't misinterpret it. I'm not bragging. But I want to tell you that some questions of political importance, legal importance, theological importance, philosophical importance, they actually require you to go into the details. Now, I'm not saying that you don't. I'm not saying that nobody does. And I'm not patting myself on the back. But just as a reminder, like, you have a question, let's say, what's the status of these territories according to Halakha? Or why do religious Jews call them Judea and Samaria? They don't call them occupied. You know, And you just start to dig. It doesn't have to be on these questions exactly. It could be on any question. And when you dig, I mean, there are different ways to dig. You can dig in the wrong direction. You can dig in the right direction. You can dig without knowing which direction you're looking for. You know, But I personally, as I wrote this paper, uh, even though it was so long ago, you know, I benefited from consulting some some of the disputes among the Supreme Court justices, some of the disputes among the Orthodox Jews and so on. Anyway, as I say, this is just the general public service announcement in terms of doing good research if you can, and I'm not claiming that mine is flawless and I'm not celebrating myself, okay? In 1975, Tradition uh, had this article called The Survey of the Recent Halakhic Periodical Literature, The Sanctity of the Liberated Territories. According to the author, Jerusalem and the West Bank are, of course, integral parts of the land of Israel, the sanctity of which is eternal. Indeed, the notion of sanctification plays an important role in the author's analysis and in Halakha. According to tradition, there were two sanctifications of the land of Israel, one which lapsed with the expulsion of the Jews following the destruction of the first temple, and one which occurred upon the return from the Babylonian exile and was efficacious for posterity. The territories of Judea and Samaria are part of the land of the second or permanent sanctification. Thus, the conclusion follows, the newly liberated areas of Judea and Samaria are integral parts of the Holy Land by virtue of the second sanctification and are endowed with the self-same sanctity as all other areas within the confines of the historic boundaries of Eretz Israel, the Hebrew for land of Israel. The halakhically Jewish understanding of the territories differs profoundly from the non-halakhic understanding of those territories, needless to say, even if the latter rejects the claim that they're entirely occupied. Summarizing the Ramban's commentary on the commandment to settle in the land of Israel, Bleich writes that there exists an obligation not simply to establish residence in the land of Israel, but also to establish a Jewish homeland upon the sanctified territory, which, as indicated in the previous paragraph, is a legal concept in Halakha, in its entirety and to settle upon and cultivate every particle of sacred soil. 
For the Ramban, one is bidden to do four things. Conquer the land by force of arms, dwell in the land, refrain from seizing any other land for the purpose of establishing a national homeland there in substitution for the land of Israel. So Jews don't get to conquer Madagascar or whatever. And not allow the land to remain in the hands of any other nation or to allow it to remain desolate. The Rambam, okay, Ramban, Rambam, two different uh, rabbis in the Jewish tradition. The Rambam, however, does not, it seems, agree with the Ramban that there's a positive commandment to settle in Israel. Blake therefore considers other aspects of the tradition that concerns the relationship to the land of Israel. So he's like, according to one rabbi, we have a religious obligation to settle there. But since there's a dispute between the rabbis, let's try to turn our attention to a different line of argumentation. Even if settlement is not a commandment, it is a merit. Another category or concept. Accordingly, the sage, the sages write that one who dwells in the land of Israel is comparable to one who has a God, but one who dwells outside the land is comparable to one who has no God. So I wrote good here, but I would assume that that's a typo, okay? Another source presents the utterance upon returning to the land of Israel of a number of individuals who dwelt outside of it in distress, who say dwelling in the land of Israel is equal to all the mitzvot, commandments, of the Torah. Okay, so what's the point here? Okay, we have Orthodox rabbis trying to understand whether you have a commandment to live in the land of Israel and whether the commandment applies to all of the quote-unquote sanctified territories which includes what in international law is called the occupied territories. Halakhically, what can be said about the notion of returning the quote-unquote liberated territories of Judea and Samaria as part of a peace process in order to remain Jewish or democratic or for some other reason? So like what do Orthodox Jews think about giving up the West Bank? Okay, restating it in normal terms. Blake discusses this issue in some detail. His analysis centers on the halakhic ruling that it is forbidden for a Jew to sell houses or fields in Eretz Yisrael, in the land of Israel, to a non-Jew. Okay, a halakhic ruling, that it's forbidden for a Jew to sell houses or fields to a non-Jew. The specific question he raises is whether the halakha demands application of the Rambam, okay, Moses Maimonides' rationale, that if non-Jews are not given an opportunity to acquire real estate, their presence in the Holy Land will be temporary and transient in nature, or whether it merely prohibits sale. So he's looking at this, okay, the details of this particular dispute. In the context of the West Bank region, transfer of political sovereignty does not constitute sale, he argues. Yet, political sovereignty assuredly carries with it an element of domiciliary permanence. Even this argument applies only to those lands in which Jews will not be forced to give up their homes for alienation of real estate within the boundaries of the land of Israel, in favor of a non-Jew would constitute a violation of the prohibition against sale. So again, this is nitty gritty, but it's a legal dispute in Israeli law, excuse me, in halakha, in Orthodox Jewish law, concerning laws prohibiting or not prohibiting the sale or transfer of real estate in the Holy Land. So it's like, on one hand, it's nitty gritty. Does it really matter? Well, it matters if we want to know what according to the Jewish laws, the status of those territories and so on, okay? So it's like a transfer of political sovereignty is not the same as a sale of a piece of real estate, you know? So there's this like, uh, but you still have to think about it. But it does constitute some sort of uh, alienation or violation, so it seems. Thus, it would be a contravention of halakha, so it seems, according to this set of arguments, to dismantle or leave any of the settlements in Judea and Samaria. Okay, look, another way of thinking about this is you want to understand the mentality of the religious Zionist settlers, let's say, okay, who are in the West Bank. What reasoning informs their worldview? Doesn't mean that you have to accept it. Doesn't mean that you have to see it or want to see it widespread. But at the very least, it's helpful to get into the mind. And the mind here is formed by a certain set of legal disputes, which are of this character. Again, on the basis of master's research I did 10 years ago. So in no sense does this pretend to be the last word. Blake, therefore, draws the conclusion that the question of the actual sale of real estate should not arise in the context of current diplomatic negotiations. Instead, the sole question to be resolved is whether or not political sovereignty may be transferred without violation of a biblical precept. If the principle of permanence is applied, transfer of political sovereignty would in itself constitute a violation of the prohibition. 
The qualification is that this is not an obligation if it engenders Jewish lives. So it's like, you can't transfer political sovereignty unless it engenders Jewish lives because the protection of a Jewish life supersedes. So Blake asks, uh, how much more then is the transfer of political sovereignty to be guarded against if land returns contribute to increased danger by rendering the military situation even more precarious? So it's like, if returning the West Bank will allow a hostile entity to set itself up on the West Bank, then the protection of Jewish life means that you can't give it up. So you have a biblical requirement not to make it more dangerous. That is, the halakha question is bound up to a certain extent with the military question of the defense consequences of land concessions. In the circumstance that land concessions rendered the military situation precarious, Jews do not have the right to return even the smallest piece of land within the boundary of Eretz Israel, in order to gain political or economic advantages which are not based upon considerations of security. It's perhaps worth emphasizing that the security concern is grounded in questions of halakha. Incidentally, you could say a corollary is that if Israel was sure that giving up political sovereignty over the West Bank would create an improved security situation and would, as a consequence, save lives, then it seems like there would be a basis in religious law for such a concession. Okay, summary. The threefold model distinguishes Jewish uh, and territories, implying that it could be consistent with, quote-unquote, Jewish to return or cede the territories in order to remain democratic. However, this disjunction is more complicated when considered halakhically. The territories are, according to Jewish law, sanctified. There are positive and negative commandments relating to them, it's unclear whether it does not contradict halakha to cede political sovereignty over any part of the territories to the Palestinian Authority, Jordan, or anyone else. As becomes apparent when reading over the footnotes of Blake's essays, the halakhic disputes over these matters are complex. Yet, I have sought to discuss the territories in light of the halakha merely in order to support my contention that the threefold model presupposes a certain understanding of its three components, which must not be presupposed but made explicit. It must be made explicit because its presupposition constitutes a selection and a rejection, the character and consequences of which are not always manifest. So you can't just like at the outset accept international law and pretend that that didn't come with all kinds of crucially relevant consequences that you're just ignoring or passing over. In the next section, I turn to discuss the question of selection and rejection among competing principles of law. And then I conclude with a few remarks about the implication of my analysis uh, for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Now we turn to what you might consider the more philosophical part of the essay called Philosophy and Law. And yes, there's a book by Leo Strauss called Philosophy and Law. Is that what I'm referring to? Who knows? The argument heretofore has been conducted through the lens of international, national, and religious law, as you've seen. In sections one and two, I contended that international law and national law conflict, right? You saw that? In sections two and three, I sought to establish that Jewish law and Israeli national democratic law conflict, right? That was the analysis of Cohen, Barak, the meaning of the phrase Jewish and democratic, and so on. At every turn, the first principles of competing law systems conflict, so it seems. This conflict has a philosophical and political component. It is enough to call to mind the Kantian impetus of the project of the United Nations in order to see that there would be a conflict between international law and the law of the Jews about whom Kant was not silent. In other words, if you understand the philosophy behind the United Nations, you understand already the implicit conflict between internationalism and the law of the Jews. Which is kind of funny given the um, what's usually said about internationalism and the Jews. Proper analysis of the role of philosophical conflict in the legal and political conflict among analysts of and parties to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict must include a consideration of Kantianism, like you have to have Kant on the table, but more especially of neo-Kantianism and the Jewish question. They must also recognize that the UN has become, in the words of Howard Sakar, a sounding board for its aggressive third world majority of Afro-Asian communist members, well before it became dominated by the 56 member uh, OIC, okay, Islamic uh, bloc. Neo-Kantian principles, neo-communist principles, Islamic principles, they are not, as I write here, compatible with the ultimate Jewish principles or principle. Now, maybe that's too strong because there's a Herman Cohen's book, a neo-Kantian Jewish thinker, but 
for the purposes of this paper, I think a stark contrast was called for. In the preface to the principles of the Jewish law, Menachem Elon makes an observation concerning the principles of the Jewish law that's no less applicable to the question of the philosophical principles of non-religious law. Okay, so let's see what he says. Frequently, both within Israel and outside it, the problems of religion and state, as they are reflected in the legal system, are discussed as well as the question of the reception of the principles of Jewish law into the legal system of the Jewish state. All too frequently, these discussions take place, and even among the intelligentsia, against a background of ignorance of the scope and detail of Jewish law. So like you can't talk about, well, what extent is Jewish law going to be incorporated into democratic law if you don't know anything about Jewish law? This is undoubtedly true. It's true, too, that discussions of law or the use of legal concepts such as occupation and democracy also take place against the background of ignorance of the scope and detail of the foundational principles of secular, international, or national law and the halakha. So let me just say here super quickly. So basically what I'm saying is just as you have to know the background of Jewish law, so too there's a lot of background that we don't really know when we talk about these things. Partially that's the background of the philosophical disputes. Okay, but let's see the continuation. For instance, without some digging, who, and like, unless you went looking for it, who would have expected a former Supreme Court justice of the Supreme Court of Israel to declare in writing, which we saw he did, that the democratic character of the state of Israel requires that the legislator reject the cardinal principle of Judaism. Like that was amazing. And a chief justice of the Supreme Court essentially to equate the meaning of the word Jewish with the meaning of the word democratic. I was encouraged to pursue this matter, as I write here in the paper, only because studies in the history of political philosophy revealed to me the interesting and relevant fact that the founder of liberal democracy was Baruch Spinoza, who founded liberal democracy as a non-Jewish assimilationist solution to the Jewish problem. And you see here, I learned that from Leo Strauss. According to Strauss, Spinoza is also the first to suggest political Zionism as a solution to that problem. Okay, so Strauss said Spinoza had two solutions to the Jewish problem. On one hand, political Zionism. On the other hand, liberal democracy, an assimilationist solution. Strauss's analyses of Spinoza are perhaps not an unworthy starting point for the philosophically serious examination of the problem of law in conflicts concerning the Jews. I wrote in section two about the International Committee of the Red Cross that they called Israel an occupier under the Fourth Geneva Conventions, despite the fact that a necessary element of the legal definition of occupation was missing. I read in the ICRC documents, okay, International Committee of the Red Cross documents, an article by John Duggard, who seeks legally to, as he wrote it, expand the concept of international armed conflict to cover essential internal conflicts in which national liberation movements are engaged in a struggle against colonial domination, alien occupation, or racist regimes. He who has been trained in left-wing thought will find nothing wrong here. I mean, this is the language of the left. But anyone trained to distinguish communistic from non-communistic political philosophical approaches will at once understand that the quote-unquote legal concepts of colonial domination, alien occupation, racist regimes, and national liberation movements is presupposing a left-wing political philosophy. And hence, masking left-wing political activism under the guise of bridging the gap between human rights and humanitarian law, as Mr. Duggard's article is called. Or will we innocently speak of the pre-communistic norms of international law? It's imperative here too to ask about presuppositions. Then it will be possible to learn, as I have learned recently, I wrote, okay, 10 years ago in this paper, of William Ladd, who's essay on the Congress of Nations for the Adjustment of International Disputes Without Arms, written in 1840, was influential in the decades preceding the Hague Conference. Ladd believed that peace could only be established through the teachings of Christianity. He writes in his essay that upon such a Congress, the storm of war would soon be hushed in Christendom, and that the main obstacle to the conversion of the heathen being removed, Christianity would soon spread all over the world. Unquote. Does not that Jew who believes himself to be a Jew owe it to himself to know that the law upon which he subjects himself or the law to which he subjects himself when referring to the Hague Convention is a law premised on Christian non-Jewish beliefs about man? 
Is the Jew not a heathen to the Christian? I mean, listen to what he wrote in 1840. The conversion of the heathen being removed, Christianity would spread all over the world. I will do no more than mention in passing here the name of that Christian German jurist of the Third Reich, Karl Schmidt. To look for the philosophical horizons of legal thought and to consider legal conflicts in light of philosophical ones is a revealing exercise. I've given a few examples of what is revealed in this practice. Former Justice Barak's claims on Spinoza's behalf, for instance, when measured against Leo Strauss's writings on Spinoza, take on an entirely new dimension. Likewise, those who invoke the language of the political left may be surprised to learn the philosophical consequences or foundations of a left or far left position. Zizek once characterized the philosophical consequences or foundations of French anti-Zionist left as follows, quote, to put it succinctly, the only true solution to the Jewish question is the final solution, their annihilation. Because Jews as objet a are the ultimate obstacle to the final solution of history itself, to the overcoming of divisions in all-encompassing unity and flexibility. In other words, once upon a time, Zizek, following through the thought of a certain French theorist, thought the only solution to the Jewish question is the annihilation of the Jews. It should surprise someone unversed in the history of political philosophy that among at least a certain segment of the left, anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism is grounded in a dialectical concept of history which aims at a final end where all contradictions are overcome, meaning also where Jews are annihilated. I fear that many of Israel's critics rely on a language of law which is impossible to dissociate from the philosophical vision of an end of history without the Jews. Indeed, I fear that many of Israel's critics and generally analysts of conflicts involving Israel lack an understanding of the interrelationship between three dimensions of those conflicts, the theological, philosophical, the legal, and the political. These interrelations can and must be revealed against the horizon that does not beg the relevant questions from the outset. It is possible that former and sitting Supreme Court justices of the state of Israel are not sufficiently aware of their own limited philosophical horizons. Salzberger and Oz Salzberger argue in the secret German sources of the Israel Supreme Court that most of them, from Wittgen to Barak, have overlooked the complex and problematic past of the German concept of the enlightened public and that of the Rechtsstaat, on which they often relied. They did not acknowledge, the authors continue, the Weimar critique of the concept of the Enlightenment, stemming from the left, Adorno, Horkheimer, Benjamin, Scholl, and Buber. The authors do not mention this, but Israel's Supreme Court justices apparently also failed to consider or to be swayed by critique of the Enlightenment by the right in Weimar, Heidegger, Schmidt, Strauss. Although, as I add parenthetically, there is a report that in 1948, Justice Pinchas Rosen was using the only available copy in Jerusalem of Schmidt's book on constitutional theory to attempt to draft the constitution for the state of Israel. Another fascinating point. Without a broader philosophical political horizon, the errors that I've begun to touch upon in this paper, the naive separation of Jewish and territorial and even more naive combination of Jewish and democratic in the threefold model and in Israeli law, will be difficult to correct or even to conceive of as errors. To conclude this section, the correct analysis of conflicts involving the Jewish people requires a better understanding of the impact on Jewish thought of philosophical movements, some of which might be completely inconsistent with the principles or even the cardinal principles of the Jewish tradition and against the better interests of the Jewish people. It's a good practice to consider carefully the relationships between law and politics especially since legal terms are often used as part of political polemics. However, it's only against the philosophical background that the problems of law and politics can be revealed as they are in themselves. This background itself is best constituted, I believe, by approaching the fundamental questions in an apparatic spirit rather than by begging the fundamental questions. So like, don't be a propagandist, be a philosopher. In other words, try to trace the questions back to their first principles. Whatever you end up doing from there is a separate question, but you know, you can't make the background clear if you don't make the relevant kind of effort. I leave it an open question whether or not a theological, as opposed to a philosophical background, does not require rather than forbid begging the relevant questions. And uh, I leave that for you to decipher. Before I read the conclusion, I just want to tell you this great book by Plato called The Laws is highly relevant to this discussion. It's an example of showing the interrelationship between the political, legal, philosophical, and theological. I'm working on a course uh, 
right now at millermanschool.com on Plato's Laws, and I highly recommend that you study it at some point. Uh, if not the course, then for sure the book. Conclusion. I have argued that the three-part model, according to which Israel can be any two, but not all three of Jewish, democratic, and territorial, is philosophically naive when approached through the fact of competing systems of law, national, international, and Jewish. This observation is necessary in order to understand that there's not only an Arab-Israeli conflict or an Israel-Palestine conflict, but a conflict of ideologies, of worldviews, of opinions about man, law, history, God, morality, politics, and many other, well, call them what you will. Or as you call them concepts, call them narratives, call them realities. The upshot of this analysis is not that it brings peace any closer. If anything, I've rocked the boat rather than stilled the waters by uncovering additional conflicts, the theological philosophical one and the intra philosophical one, before contributing to the resolution of the Israeli Arab or Israel Palestine conflicts. Yet all is not lost. Clarity, perhaps, has been gained. Clarity brings to the conflict the important insight, which was not shared by Ladd, that peace cannot be established on the basis of a limited horizon, faulty assumptions, and good intentions. It illuminates the conflicts behind and beyond the one we began with. The way we aim to resolve the first conflict, one state, two states, binational state, status quo, will depend on the way we conceive of the more basic conflict of principles. That's what I wrote. Now I'd say, perhaps. Knowing this, analysts should gain a better understanding of the implications of their models and their terms. Once these have been clarified, perhaps the possibilities for a peaceful modus vivendi will have been two. So that's the article. That's the argument. I want to tell you that I'm going to have a link to the article in case you would like to read the footnotes or refer to the bibliography so you can see, oh, something there was interesting, like survey of recent halakhic periodic literature. Where do I find that? How do I find that? What about Strauss on Spinoza? You know, what, what did he say? Where can I find that? So if you want to take a closer look at the paper, you'll be able to do so. And look, this was long. I'm trying to get into the habit of making shorter videos. This obviously is not one of them. But especially given the war now, occupation, occupation, liberation, liberation, revolution, revolution, okay, without saying you know, obviously, you may know, you know, I am a supporter of the state of Israel. And uh, at the same time, like I had a video not long ago with Lauren Southern on Russia and uh, Ukraine, you know, I think if you're a human being, then you grieve for the innocent lives lost. So this paper is not about your dead are worth more than our dead, that kind of thing. Okay. This paper in this video is about how do we get to the roots of an analysis of a political phenomenon by means of comparative legal perspectives, if that's even a relevant place to go to. I said that as I was writing this paper as a master's student 10 years ago, it did seem to me to bring things to light that I wasn't seeing otherwise. And then in order to adjudicate the legal dispute, the dispute between international, national, and religious law, it's kind of like you end up going one step further you know, you end up going into questions of reason and revelation, you know, fundamental questions of what philosophy is and can accomplish, conflicts at the level of first philosophical principles. So this paper invites an ascent. You know, you can see it as going up to the first principles. You can see it as going down into the details of each of these legal systems, but it's something that I hope accomplishes the task of getting us to think more clearly. You know, as I say, the goal, yeah, we cross our fingers as human beings for a goal of peace, but as, in, as intelligent creatures, as thinking creatures, we also want clarity about the basic problems. So that's what I had in mind with this paper. That's what I had in mind with this video. Um, you see here on screen, if you're interested in the kind of thing that I just said in any capacity, I have a school that teaches all kinds of books and philosophers, paid courses, and I have philosophyintro.com, which is a free email introduction to philosophy and uh, this book on Plato's laws. So there are places to turn to next if you'd like to. I welcome your comments, your responses. Try to keep it decent and civil if you can. I know this topic often brings out very heated, passionate, emotional responses, rightfully so. But uh, in this particular context, it'd be nice to keep it at the level of, uh, you know, on topic and in, in, in the sense that we want the legal, philosophical, theological, 
disputes and not so much the uh, emotional reactions to current events as heartbreaking as they may be. So thank you for your time and attention. Hope you enjoyed this. Like, subscribe, share, comment, and take care.